Danny and I are not on the same page with this. You what? Danny and I are not on the same page with this. Hello everybody and welcome back. This episode is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Yes! Actually, slightly less yesterday. Let me finish my mouthful. A few moments later. Normally I always film these Magic Spoon ads in the morning so I get to have like the Magic Spoon as... I mean, usually a second breakfast because I'm at the office and I'm a greedy fuck. But uh, I actually just had a fairly large lunch. So sadly, I'm not probably going to finish this bowl of cereal because I'm, I'm, I'm quite full already. But the taste of Magic Spoon, objectively, is as good as it's ever been because of course it is! Big Red, read nutritional values verbatim due to legal reasons. Very well, Magic Spoon, I shall do just thus that. Magic Spoon is a cereal. And you might be thinking, oh boy, cereal is full of sugar. Uh, no. No. Zero grams of sugar. Four grams of net carbs. Fourteen grams of protein. Oh my god, you need that protein because then you can become big and ripped like your boy. Urgh! Not really, I'm not very strong, but uh, Magic Spoon is, is getting me there, or at least not making me super fat. I used to eat a ton of cereal when I was a kid, and then basically I stopped because I was like, I don't need all that sugar, it's probably just going to make me fat. And I discovered Magic Spoon, and they sent me this, and they sent me all of their other flavors as well. Uh, there's the, the, what's this one? This is sugar? Oh, Frosted, yeah, so like sugar. And then Fruity, and there's Choco, and there's a whole bunch over there on my shelf. Many of them empty, unfortunately. Uh, my favorite, talked about it before, peanut butter. Cinnamon. Honestly, I ate so much of the cinnamon. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's probably not great for Magic Spoon, but I ate so much of it, I just became super sick of it, and I was like, I can't eat that anymore. But it is because it's delicious. I mean, that's not bad. That's good. Oh, yeah, the things that I've got to read because of legal reasons. I did that! I did that! I hit it all! And what? It's, uh, how many calories? 140! Per serving. Ooh! This one's 170. Danger, danger. But zero grams of sugar. Look, guys, it's all good. It tastes amazing. We said that. Honestly, too good to be true. I mean, it does feel a little bit like cheating. <laughs> It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. I couldn't care about any of that stuff, but I gather there are people who do. Amazing flavors! I mentioned the flavors! Talk about the great flavors! I talked about the great flavors! Call to action. That's what we need. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own variety box. I'm telling you, put some peanut butter in there. Just do it. Get the Choco one as well. Mix them together. Reese's style, yes! And people might be saying, like, what do you know about Reese's? You're not American. And it's like, no. But I have tried that and that is one thing America got right. Uh, you can use my code BLAZE for $5 off, plus you can choose from the best-selling cocoa. I said this already! This is the problem when I go so... I've done Magic Spoon so many times that I've just got so wildly off the points. They do bold the big legal stuff for me, though. Again, click the link below, code BLAZE, $5 off, magicspoon.com forward slash BLAZE, yes, thank you, into the video. Hello, hello, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. This one uh, is an absolute ripoff of myself. I have another channel, you might be aware, this isn't the only thing I do on the internet. If you, uh, if this is the first thing you've seen by me, you're probably very confused, you know, who is this prick, and uh, you're probably clicked off already. My heart is sad. Uh, I have another channel called Top Tens. It's actually the first ever YouTube channel that I did. And one of the, I'm not sure if it was one of the first videos we ever made, but it was definitely one of the most popular videos we've ever made, was geniuses who were also dickheads. Like, um, that Beatle. Uh, was it Paul McCartney? I don't, I feel like, it's not Paul McCartney, is it? Uh, John Lennon! John Lennon, of course. Sorry, Paul. <laughs> I don't know, you might be a dick as well. I don't know for sure. I don't know you. But uh, John Lennon had a bit of a reputation being a knob, right? And, uh, but he's also a genius because apparently he wrote songs that were, were good. I love the Beatles. I think the Beatles music is fantastic. Is it to the level of insanely good though? I mean, it's very good and very enjoyable music. But I feel people say like the Beatles is some sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's music, there's music, and then there's the Beatles. No. Oh my god, there was it was trending on Twitter the other day whether Drake was uh, as big as the Beatles uh, or um, was the other one Michael Jackson? And it's like, th no. I can't name a single Drake song. I don't know what Drake looks like. I know he's Canadian for some reason, but that's literally the only thing I know about Jake. Jake. 
Drake. And it's literally the only thing I want to know. I'm pretty sure I'll hate his music. Because I've told this story before, but I was like, Justin Bieber's very popular. I wonder what this Justin Bieber stuff's about. I mean, his music must be good. And then I listened to his music, and then I just became very confused by humanity's taste in music. It was fucking horrible. You think it sounds like crap too? It doesn't sound like crap at all. I think it's awesome. Uh, so yeah, we're doing. Oh my god, Simon, this is the longest introduction ever. What is wrong with you? Get back on track and talk about geniuses who were also dickheads. That video, uh, it did well on top 10, so I thought we'd remake it in the Business Blaze style. That's what we're doing here. If you're new, Danny writes me a script, that's what he's written, I'm going to read, and then Sam is going to sprinkle in some of the finest vintage memes that you have ever seen. Yes! There's a track on Simon Garfunkel's final album from 1970's Bridge Over Troubled Water. Like a bridge over troubled water, which closes the first side of the record with a sim with simple and beautiful elegance. It, wait, is Simon or Garfunkel? And one of them, I, I did realize, I like Garfunkel. It's definitely like Paul Simon, an Art Garfunkel, right? And Paul Simon's a lot more famous than Art Garfunkel. These Paul Simon's good. Is Paul Simon a dick? I hope not. A fucking human being, man! The song is called So Long Frank Lloyd Wright, and I always found it to be one of the most mesmerizing and intriguing tracks on my dad's battered and scratched vinyl copy of the album. But it took me years to discover the true meaning of the song, partly because I'd never heard of Frank Lloyd Wright. Isn't he's a playwright, right? I'm fairly sure I've seen several of his plays. And now I'm struggling to name a single one. From the simple lyrics, maybe he's not even a playwright and that's some other dude called Wright. <laughs> it's like, that's embarrassing, Whistleboy. <laughs> or maybe I just edited this whole thing out. <laughs> From the simple lyrics scattered across an unusual melody drenched in congas and strings and flutes, I guessed that he was probably an architect. And from the title lyrics and oozing melancholy, I guessed that he had died quite possibly recently and that Simon and Garfunkel were quite sad about that. What I didn't know until a long time afterwards is that Frank Lloyd Wright, who had died 11 years earlier in 1959, wasn't just any old architect. He was widely regarded as a genius. Wait, he is an architect, so who the fuck's the playwright? <laughs> ah, there's definitely a playwright called like Lloyd Wright or something. Oh my god, this is embarrassing. I... Stop it. Get some help. He is widely regarded as a genius, and many would even suggest that he was the greatest American architect of all time. Oh, I see. This is going to be one of those episodes where everyone in the comments is being like, oh, Simon's just playing it up that he doesn't know who Frank Lloyd Wright is. And I'll point out that Danny didn't either, into later age, because just because it's famous in America doesn't mean it's famous anywhere else, despite what... What, I don't know, the internet seems to tell you. I wasn't very likely to know that as a kid, though. I don't think Frank designed many buildings in Rotherham. Funnily enough, Paul Simon has since revealed that he didn't have the foggiest idea who Frank Lloyd Wright was either. And he wrote the song. <laughs> Art Garfunkel himself, an architecture major, had suggested that Paul should write a song about the sad passing of the famous architect. But instead, Paul, why don't you do it yourself, Art? It's called Simon and Garfunkel for a reason. You think it's all just Simon? It is though, right? It, it was mostly Paul Simon, isn't that the joke? I don't know and I don't care. But instead, Paul wrote a song about the upcoming breakup of the tumultuous relationship between, of Simon and Garfunkel, the architects of some of the greatest songs of all time. But about Bob Tom! He was effectively saying goodbye to his partner, but he didn't bother telling Art the true meaning of the song until years later. Oh sh! Paul, oh! Frank Lloyd Wright may have been the greatest architect who ever lived, although admittedly that was his own opinion, which he was very happy to repeat to anyone who cared to listen. Yeah, that's what I do. When I, I know I meet someone new, so oh, what do you do? I'm a YouTuber. And they're like, oh, that's great. Like, what sort of YouTube? Well, I'm only the greatest YouTuber ever lived. And they're like, really? I've never heard of you, and I've heard of Jake Paul, <laughs> and he's a bell. <laughs> Are you more of a bell than Jake Paul? I mean, that's impossible, allegedly. Wait, I get confused between them. Which one's the dickhead? Is it Logan or Jake? Why are we talking about this? No one cares. It's the, 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 the suicide forest one. It's like, oh my god, dude. No. <laughs> but he's just one example of a genius whose widely celebrated legacy manages to brush the darker aspects of a deeply troubled character under the lush carpet of history. Oh, so Frank Lloyd writes the dick. Not uh, Simon or Garfunkel. Thank God. Except, I mean, that was a bit of a dick move, Paul Simon, wasn't it? It's like, yeah, yeah, I got this. I got. <laughs> I like that. Uh, this is about us breaking up. You're going to find out that later. <laughs> this song's going to have a different meaning then, isn't it? Isn't it, Art? <laughs> uh, over his long... 
Zoinks! It's the gay blade! Over his long life and career, Frank designed about a thousand buildings, of which about 400 were actually built. He's often credited with shaping the future of American architecture, inventing both organic architecture, something I've never heard of, in which buildings are designed in harmony with humanity and the environment. It'd be a bit weird if they weren't, though, wouldn't it? It's like, yeah, what did you do? We made a building that's in harmony with people in the environment. What does that mean? Well, it's in the environment, and all the doors are the correct height for people. Because if you were doing inorganic, why are you making, you're making it for cats? <laughs> why is this? A building for ants? And the prairie-style all-horizontal lines and flat roofs and broad overhanging eaves. Fortune appeared to be shining on a young Frank when he first moved from Wisconsin to Chicago to pursue a career in architecture in 1887, the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. <laughs> it's like, great news, Frank. There's been a giant fire. How many people have died? But that's a blank canvas, isn't it, Frank? Go nuts. Uh, it's great devastation in the city and this disaster, along with population boom, meant that people were positively crying out for good architects. After working his way up the ladder at Adler and Sullivan, he was eventually booted out after it was discovered that he was secretly working on side projects. Speaking of side projects, I've got a channel called Side Projects that you might want to subscribe to. I'd say there's a link in the description below, but I've almost certainly forgotten to put it there. So that was a fucking lie. Or bootleg houses outside of the firm, and this apparently broke the terms of his contract. This was one of the odd things about Frank. Despite the fact that he would have been earning top whack, he always felt the need to moonlight on other projects to top up his income. And yet, he was very often skinned. He sounds greedy and like he spends too much money. He seemed to enjoy constantly blowing more cash on his ridiculously extravagant lifestyle that he could realistically afford than he could realistically afford to spend and they would always find himself out of pocket i do find it uh, like i understand like when you don't have much money and you spend all of your money that is like absolutely completely get it like because that's how much you need to live but when people who are rich spend all their money it's like what the f are you up to <laughs> what if the gravy train stops i'm like you know I save so much money because I'm like, oh my god, all of this could go away. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I have no other marketable skills. <laughs> oh, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I bought like seven Ferraris. It's like, you did what? What are you doing? <laughs> it's like, for cash? No, no, no. I just have seven monthly payments for Ferraris. It's like, what is your... No! I don't understand. You need some sort of advice. <laughs> you just need a parent to tell you stop. And, and yes, that applies if you're still 35. I'd like to think that if I was just spending all my money and just absolutely living on the edge, he, my, one of my parents would be like, have you considered not doing that? And I'll be like, oh, shut the f*** up. <laughs> but yeah, so no, there's no good solution to this, is there? Because I, I, I think that let's just, let's just move on. It's a disaster. Frank, it's a disaster. You know what? It doesn't matter because it was going downhill straight from there. He had set up his own firm by 1893 and money was still a big issue. Although by now, it had become the problem of the clients for who he was building. Just about every Frank Lloyd Wright project in history always went massively over budget and so every client that he ever dealt with ended up forking out far more than they were originally promised. Many of his clients may also have been taken aback by Frank's obsessive attention to detail, which often included the design of the stationery and napkin holders that should be used by the new owners of the house. Yeah, I mean, I gotta say, like, this is, uh, it's gonna get very expensive, but it's also really cool, and I bet that's gonna be a nice house. It's like, if you're, if you're, what was it? Napkin holders tie in with the architectural theme of your house? I mean, that's, that's pretty ballin', to be honest. That's, that's some crib shit right there. But I mean cribs with taste. Because, yeah, cribs is like the antithesis of, of taste. Actually, no, that'd be pimp my ride. But cribs is close. Anyway, enough 90s MTV references, let's move on. Thank you so much! It became clear that Frank cared far more about the houses than he did about the wishes of the clients who were paying for them. If he caught a client wearing a dress that he feared would clash with the design of the house, Frank would demand that the client get rid of it before resuming work. <laughs> it's like, Frank, you might be talented, but you're also a dick. If this was, if this was my architect, I don't know, I think it's just because I'm, you know... <laughs> If I'm hiring someone like to, to architect my house or whatever, I'll be like, don't forget who's in charge. And it's like, and Frank might be, but I'm the most talented architect of my generation. I'd be like, that's fantastic. You're fired. <laughs> but your napkin holders are not going to match up with your bathrobes. And I'd be like, yeah, Frank, I don't give a shit. Get the fuck 
Why are you still here? I don't know you and I don't care. And he didn't appear to have much time for trivial complaints either when one of his clients complained that water was leaking from the ceiling onto his desk and leaky ceilings were a common feature of a Frank Lloyd Wright house. The architect simply advised the clients to move the desk. He appeared to show off his generous and thoughtful side when he once posted a gift to a couple of teachers who had just bought and moved into one of his new prairie homes. The baggage contained a beautiful and wildly expensive vase and came with a little note which read, I thought this would look perfect over the mantelpiece. <laughs> it's going to be like an invoice attached to it, isn't it? It's like, yeah, don't forget to pay the $5,000 for this vase to this shop. Uh oh. I'm sure it did look very nice, but the teachers weren't so impressed when they received another item of post from Frank just two weeks later. The f***ing bill. It was a bill for the vase. Yes, it was. Big brain. While it may seem a shame that Frank cared more about the houses than his clients, it's downright tragic that he also cared far more about his houses than his own wife and kids. He first married in 1889 to Catherine Lee Kitty Tobin, who was for whom he, with whom he had four sons and two daughters. Damn. But he, oh, it's the 18, 1880s. They had more kids back then because they were like, well, at least 10%, 10%, <laughs> 90% we're going to die. Oh my god, the past was the worst. But he also later confessed that he felt more paternal love for buildings than flesh and blood. I'm not sure if that's more tragic. Because, I mean, of course it is, because it's like his family and stuff, but it's like, that's his business. When his entire, like, career is built around just not giving a shit about what other people think, I feel like that's upsetting more people. Now nah, the family thing's more tragic. I'm sorry, Danny, you're right. In fact, he treated his family like design accessories. Whenever he was offering clients or guests a tour of his home, he would put his wife and children in strategic positions around the house like living dolls to enhance the viewing experience. Oh my god, what is wrong with you? <laughs> in many ways, Frank himself was one of the kids. Instead of taking on the role of a fatherly figure, he competed with them for the undivided attention and devotion from their mother. That is mega dysfunctional, my dude. Kitty found it difficult to spend all day showering Frank with praise, as she should because he's a adult man he needs to get shit together when she was also trying to raise six children without any help sounds like frank should have used some of his extravagant lifestyle money on a fucking nanny frank eventually got fed up and eloped <laughs> fed up with not getting showered with enough attention are we frank you prick with mama borswick cheney the wife of a client he had been working with at the time frank and mama ran off to europe abandoning kitty and the six kids to flounder under the massive debt that had left in his flamboyant trail an amount worth about twenty three thousand dollars today that doesn't sound that bad does it twenty three thousand dollars today i mean i don't want to seem out of touch but normally when it's in one of these like stories it's like some big architect dude he's the greatest architect of his generation like doing all of this design things and craziness and then his debt was twenty three thousand dollars i'd be like wait isn't that like the the price of like a fairly average car um okay let's move on Frank and Mama were not destined to live happily ever after, though. After returning to the U.S. in 1910, Frank built a fancy new family home called Tallison in Spring Green, Wisconsin. He was only able to build the 600-acre estate. Holy sh! After persuading his mum to buy the land for him, but brutal tragedy awaited just around the corner. It's not entirely clear why the chef and servant Julian Carlton lost the plot one day in 1914 while Frank was away on business in Chicago. It's been speculated that Julian had held a grudge against Frank after learning on the grapevine that he was to be replaced but he had already been acting in a disturbed manner, which was probably the reason for his dismissal. After Frank left for Chicago, Julian set the Tallison estate on fire and then went on a rampage with a hatchet, murdering seven people, including Mama, her two children, the gardener, and other workmen. Holy sh**. I mean, this took, a do this took a turn from being like, yeah, 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 that guy was a bit of a dick, wasn't he? And uh, yeah, now it's like his his chef has murdered his whole staff and family. And then he tried to commit suicide by swallowing a small vial of hydrochloric acid. That sounds like a horrible f***ing way to die. That didn't kill him, but severely burnt his esophagus, which made it difficult for him to ingest food. Seven years late, seven weeks later, he would die from starvation in a Dogeville jail. Following such a harrowing experience, you might expect Frank to share some empathy with his fellow human beings who were struggling through deeply traumatic times, but it appears that his heart was made of stone. Ah, uh, yeah, but also... People don't really change that much, do they? I mean, you can have some tragic event, and I think it'll change how you feel about things for about a week. And then you're like, ah, oh, yeah, but don't forget, I'm still a dick. <laughs> yeah, still a dick. Frank's always been a dick, allegedly. I haven't done enough allegedly today. I'm gonna get sued by the Lloyd Webber estate. The Great Kanto Earthquake, which struck what is going on. 
Why are we talking about an earthquake in Tokyo? <laughs> Danny, is this another one where you've not included subtitles? The Great Kanto Earthquake, which struck the Tokyo Yokohama metropolitan area in 1923, claimed approximately 140,000 lives and utterly destroyed hundreds of thousands of homes in the region. Okay, wait, is Frank gonna go there? I'm like, yes! <laughs> How many people died? 140,000 people! That's, that's, there's gonna be, that, there's a blank canvas, baby. Hell yeah. Heart of fing stone. All Frank wanted to know was if his Imperial Hotel building in Tokyo was still standing and he was able to give himself a smug pat on the back when he learned that his pioneering earthquake-proof structure had survived the devastation. Mm. That is not... I don't... I, I'm just like, he's so self-absorbed. Like, there's a different... Uh, no, is there a difference between being super self-absorbed and being a dickhead? I like to think there is because I'm a bit self-absorbed myself. Um, but there's probably not really, is there? It's like, yeah, yeah, no, you're a dickhead because you're self-absorbed. it. Much later on, during the Nazi bombing of Europe in World War II, Frank suggested that it might actually be a blessing in disguise, as it would give the architects of Europe an opportunity to try and build something half-decent for a change. <laughs> ah. By 1932, Frank was living in a renovated tal... Tally Sin Estate with his third wife, Olgivana. Okay, interesting name, but even the, in these later years of his life, he was still facing the perennial problem which had plagued him for decades. He couldn't stop himself from splashing too much money around and then ending up completely broke. I mean, it does seem that everything always works out for him. He's probably, it's just one of these people, you know, he's just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I made fun of it. And it's like, yeah, you shouldn't spend all your money. You should save some money. Because what if the gravy tame stops? And then do you want to be poor again? That would suck. And, but he seems to be just one of these people who's like, it always just works out. It's like, no, 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 I was super rich. And that was a great time. And then I ran out of money. But don't worry, I made more money. Woo! So, all right, Frank, you bastard. In the face of financial ruin, he came up with an idea which may have been a masterpiece of cunning design. He founded the Taliesin Fellowship, in which, over the course of the next few decades, right up until his death in 1959, he invited hundreds of students to pay him huge tuition fees in return for the opportunity to come and board at his house while studying architecture and spiritual development from the master. I mean, it's a fairly good idea, isn't it? I mean, because, yeah, you could go and design buildings, or you could teach people how to design buildings, because everyone loves your buildings. I mean, it doesn't fit, it's just, isn't that just called teaching, or apprenticeships, or whatever? Seems like a good idea. There were no formal qualifications on offer from this expensive private course. I don't think there need to be. I mean, we make, we make fun of him saying he's like the greatest architect ever, but he is a very famous architect, and I, I you know, I'm vaguely hurt, familiar with his name, after confusing it with some playwright who I don't remember. Is that Andrew Lloyd Webber? Yes! Yeah, there we go! I don't know how I... What was this dude's name? Andrew Lloyd Webber. Webber. Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay, I see how I got there. Big brain. Oh, they got three names. One of them's the same. <laughs> Not so big brain. Excuse me, what are you doing? But yeah, I, what I was trying to say is if he is one of the like greatest architects ever, then it doesn't matter if he's offering some formal qualification or you could be like, yeah, I studied under him and it's probably going to get you a job. And honestly, it's probably going to make you a better architect. So I'm like, I'm totally okay with that. This is a great idea. Good for him. And most of the architectural study involved getting the students to work on improvements to his own property. I mean, okay, now we're pushing it a bit far, aren't we, Frankie? Not only that, but they were also expected to farm his crops, clean, make dinner and put up with Frank's erratic and abusive behavior. <laughs> oh, sh what it actually done was hire a team of servants who'd work at a hire, though. They, they paid him, this big brain, <laughs> to work in his house and attend to his every whim while actually paying him for the privilege. That's probably a hint of genius buried somewhere in this fiendish scheme cooked up by Frank Lloyd Wrong. Oh my god. This is what I should do. Bill myself as the greatest YouTuber ever, then invite people to my office slash basement and be like, yeah, what are you doing? You're working for free. And uh, also, I will have a sandwich. Thank you and uh, you have to pay me. I feel like this would definitely be illegal today. It's like, the, the, if I wanted someone, and I feel like I could teach people a lot about this whole like video thing, and I feel like that would be a good thing, but I would still have to, if I didn't pay them, even though it's like a great opportunity, I feel like there'd be a big issue there. People would be like, Simon, you can't just have people working for you for free. And it's like, yeah, but they're learning a lot. Be like, Simon. Bad news. What? That's slavery. <laughs> Shit. Oh no. Anyway. But then again, if I flip the situation and I was young me and I wanted to learn about something, I'd definitely 
I guess it's called volunteering. Is it called volunteering? I'll definitely do it for free. Because I'll be like, oh, shit, that's probably a good connection to make. Or Whistleboy there with all of his channels. I don't know. Don't get any ideas. Don't send me any emails. I'm busy. <laughs> you can't come and work for me. And I'm not paying you. It could be argued that Frank wasn't even a particularly brilliant architect, as many of his buildings have since been demolished due to huge engineering flaws, which were then too expensive to patch up. Wait, isn't that like the structural engineer's job? I don't know, it, like, there's always that meme I saw, which is like architect's vision, and it's some beautiful, like, palace dome, and then it's like structural engineer's revision, it looks like something out of a f communist, you know, area, like, big block, nothing boring thing. But. I don't know what I'm talking about, so let's just move on. His legacy is a collection of buildings which have either been purposefully destroyed or lost to the forces of nature, but not any earthquakes. Uh, whilst the majority of his surviving buildings are rarely visited because they were built in silly places which aren't immediately accessible. So how did he become so famous then? So long, Frank Lloyd Wright. Someone should probably have written a song about him. Ah, put a bob bob. Yes, Elia Kazan. Oh. In 1999, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro took to the stage of the 71st Academy Awards to present the Academy Honorary Award. That year, it was going to 81-year-old Elia Kazan, a visionary stage and movie director who had already bagged two Oscars over his long career, stretching back to the 1940s. Many of Kazan's hard-hitting films dealt with personal and social issues, and his long chain of highly acclaimed classics includes On the Waterfront, East of Eden, and a streetcar named Desire. I have seen none of those. Oh, there's a fucking surprise. Kazan also single <laughs> surprising nobody there, Simon. Kazan also single-handedly launched the careers of cinema legends such as Marlon Brando, Jack Palance, Warren Betty, James Dean. I've seen a Marlon Brando movie. I'm not sure I've seen movies by any of these other people, and I've never heard of Jack Palance. And the New York Times, isn't it so crazy? I'm sure Jack Palance was like the Tom Cruise of his day. And it's just, fame is so bleating. Like, the fact that I don't even know who he is. In fact, I've never heard his name before. It's never stuck in my mind. Jack Palance, who I'm sure was the Tom Cruise of his day. And now it's just like, yeah, no, no one really knows who that guy is. I mean, people probably do, but I don't. And that's what matters. And the New York Times described him as one of the most honored and influential directors in Broadway and Hollywood history. So it's clear that he was deemed by many to be a worthy recipient of such a prestigious Academy Honor that day in 1999. And as he made his way to the stage to pick up his gong, he received a standing ovation from the likes of Warren Betty, Kathy Bates, and Meryl Streep. Wait, they give a gong away at the Academy Awards? Isn't it a statuette? They don't get gongs, do they? What is a gong? Isn't that a thing you ring? But not everyone in the audience appeared to be quite so enthusiastic. For example, Steven Spielberg was happy to offer a polite clap, but there was no way he was getting up from his seat as the camera panned around the audience. We could see a big chunk of other notable names with stone-cold expressions, point-blank refusing to even applaud. Oh my god, what did this person do? <laughs> that is savage. <laughs> Where it's like, I don't know, if you're at something and everyone else is clapping, you're just like, yeah, I think this guy's a bell end, but woo, yeah, nice one. Nice one, mate. Yeah, great. I'm such a sheep. Uh, these grim and unapproving faces, including Nick Nolte, Ed Harris, and Ian McClellan. Uh, meanwhile, outside the building, 250 demonstrators gathered in protest over the decision to give the award to Elia Kazan. Why? Because Elia Kazan was a dirty snitch who ratted on his former comrades. What? Born in Istanbul in 1909, Kazan arrived in New York as the son of a rug merchant. He spent a brief spell in the 1930s as a member of the Communist Party of America. But by the 1940s, he had put all of that behind him and he had found fame and fortune as an acclaimed director of the stage, who then made an equally successive tr successful transition onto the silver screen. But in what was undoubtedly Hollywood's darkest hour, the 1950s witch hunt, which launched, oh wait, he's one of these guys on the blacklist who snitched on the other people on the blacklist? Oh, I see why they're not clapping. <laughs> uh, the Night 50s witch hunt launched by Senator McCarthy was on a mission to purge Hollywood of leftists under the hysterical notion that communists were working behind the movie cameras and attempting to secretly subvert the American or cinema audience with communist propaganda. I mean, it, it, in retrospect, it's absurd. But at the time, I'm like, well, hang on. I, like, definitely put my own opinions into these videos. And if my opinions became frowned upon by the establishment, of course I'm gonna be leaned on to like, if the establishment is like crazy and intense like McCarthyism, of course I'm gonna be leaned on to stop doing that shit. 
And of course, and it's not absurd to think that I'd be putting my own thoughts and stuff into the videos that I make. It doesn't seem unreasonable at all to think that that was happening, and McCarthy wanted to stop it. It doesn't mean I support that it happened in any way whatsoever, and I think it's f crazy, but it doesn't it does it a little bit of sense yeah well you know that's just like uh your opinion man as a known former member of the communist party of america chasm was i have no idea if i'm pronouncing this guy's name correctly by the way chasm was called before the house on american activities committee or huac I have no idea if that's how you pronounce HUAC. It's H U A C. HUAC! And was asked to identify any former members of the party now working in the industry so that they could be added to the infamous Hollywood blacklist and permanently struck off the payroll. At first, Gazen crept quiet, but when it became clear that Gazen could potentially save his own future career by becoming a treacherous informant, he sang like a canary and reeled off a total of eight names of acting colleagues, playwrights, and friends. He knowingly destroyed their careers in the process. Gazen, you prick. Shut your mouth. Meanwhile, his own career went from strength to strength, as he picked up another Oscar just two years after giving testimony, and went on to direct a further 12 films over the next 25 years. However, we are ignoring something important. His ideology might have changed. And we're kind of saying this guy did this to save his career. But he wasn't a member of the Communist Party for a long time before the witch hunt began. It was 10 years at least. So he could have changed his ideology towards capitalism or being pro not having communists working in Hollywood, which is, while it's something we like I don't agree with it doesn't make him a snitch it makes him someone I mean it does make him a snitch because he snitched but it's like he's not snitching to save his own skin he's snitching because that's what he morally believes in if that's actually what happened maybe he's just a snitch to save his own career but I don't think we should ignore the possibility at least I've never heard of this situation so I don't know who this guy is but based on what we've been told here it's possible this ideology changed I don't know the fuck is he talking about giving him a lot of credit here, Simon, aren't we? People are like, why are you doing that? <laughs> I don't know. Just giving him a fair shake, you know? How dare you? He appeared to show no reserve over his actions a couple of days after he squealed to the committee. He took out a full-page ad in the New York Times, which encouraged other former liberals to do the right thing and become an informer so that America could be saved from a dangerous and alien conspiracy. Okay, so he did this seemingly acting on his own personal, like, morals and beliefs. In which case, this makes it much less about snitching and just being, like he's on that that side like he's anti-communist and he wants to get these communists out of hollywood which while a bad thing is not the same as snitching on people and betraying them right am i off am i off whack with this that doesn't seem unreasonable nope nope stop talking go to jail a much later in his 1988 autobiography, Imaginatively Titled, blah, 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 imaginatively titled A Life, he was still standing by his actions, writing, I did this out of my true self. Everything before was 17 years of posturing. Well, it's all like, so you were posturing as a communist? It's okay to have been a communist and then changed your mind. It's like, that's all right. It's cool. This, I've changed my mind on all sorts of shit as I've got older. I feel like I change my mind every few years. Every year. It's like the shit that I used to believe that I'm like, nah, I don't really agree with that anymore. And the shit that I don't agree with now that I'm sure I'll agree with or disagree with or something. It's okay to change your opinion. It's a good thing. Remember, you should. The same alarmingly honest book refers to quite a miserable, unpleasant, angry, and deceitful individual who viewed his friends and associates and even lovers with a chilling detachment. The main in your own autobiography you come across as having a chilling detachment. It's not a good thing. The main point to bear in mind here is that Kazen really didn't like to hand over those eight names to didn't re the main point to bear in mind here is that Kazen really didn't have to hand over those eight names to carry on working. Well okay, that makes it again, we're pushing this towards it being an ideological decision rather than a self serving decision. Broadway was largely unaffected by the blacklist, so he could have turned his back on Hollywood and resumed his lucrative career as a stage director without selling out his former friends. Yeah, but they were his former friends, and he sees them now as his enemy. I don't think I'm being crazy here. Instead, he chose to consciously crush the credible careers of his communist cop. They're nice f***ing comrades. Just because he quite fancy making another movie. Danny and I are not on the same page with this. You what? Danny and I are not on the same page with this. <laughs> F 
Orson Welles issued a pretty frank response when he was asked his opinion on the director in 1982. Ilya Kazin is a traitor. He is a man who sold to McCarthy all his companions at a time when he could have continued to work at a high salary. And having sold all his people to McCarthy, he then made a film called On the Waterfront, which was a, celebra which was a celebration of the informer. That last bit is kind of true. The Oscar-winning crime drama from 1953 starred a young Marlon Brando as a troubled dock worker who is depicted as having done the right thing by becoming a snitch. The situation is very different, though. Marlon Brando is undoubtedly a hero in, in the film, as he bravely risks his own life by giving damning testimony against a violent, corrupt union boss who had frightened the rest of the town into complicit silence. It's not different. I mean, it's not, of course it's different, but it also just depends your views are not his views, Danny, or anyone who's watching this. It's like, just because you believe something, like I don't believe in getting communists out of Hollywood. I don't believe that the blacklist was a good thing. I think McCarthyanism was a f***ing train wreck. But that doesn't mean that this dude has those same beliefs. He can believe what he wants and believe that he is acting morally, even if you disagree with his morals. Why am I having to explain this like seven times? It's f***ing obvious. I don't remember asking you a goddamn thing. That's not quite the same as needlessly selling out your raft for f***ing sake. Let's just move on to the next entry. <laughs> it's the first time this has ever happened. John Lennon. The Beatles came up with plenty of deep and meaningful lyrics throughout the 1960s, which reward patience and an intense scrutiny. We all live in a yellow submarine. No. Yellow must matter custard dripping from a dead dog's eye. Don't know that one. <laughs> you can't sing along with that. <laughs> I'm sorry that I doubted you. I was so unfair. You were in a car crash and lost all your hair. Okay, apparently I don't know the Beatles that well because I only know the first line that we live in a yellow submarine. And then there's this revealing line from the track Getting Better on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band's album from 1967. I used to be cruel to my woman. I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved. Holy sh**. <laughs> I don't remember that at all. But it's like, dude, man, you are taking, like, writing down your crimes to a new level. You're writing down your crimes in a song lyric. In a Beatles song. It's gonna be a big deal, John. Although the track was sung and largely written by Paul McCartney. If I was Paul McCartney, I'd be, I'd be like, John, mate, I can't sing that. It makes me sound like a wife beater. And John will be like, yeah, I know. <laughs> but that's not so bad, is it, Paul? I mean, we all beat our wives occasionally, don't we, Paul? And Paul will be like... What are you talking about, John? <laughs> you brick! Allegedly. And during this later era when the Beatles were mainly singing songs about walruses and octopus, octopus gardens and rocking horse people eating marshmallow pies, this was a curiously sinister and distinctly autobiographical line from Lennon. I've always believed that Lennon and McCartney forms the greatest ever songwriting relationship in history within the world's greatest ever band. This is what I'm talking about. It's like, I like the Beatles. I think their music is fantastic. But gr greatest ever songwriting relationship in history? Let me tell you about Chad Kroger's drummer. No, I'm just kidding. Chad Kroger is the Nickelback guy, right? Uh, uh, particularly when you consider the vast quantity of incredible work that they were pumping out within such a relatively brief period. Indeed, it was insane. But I've also been aware that despite my love of Lennon's work within the Beatles anyway, his later solo within the Beatles anyway, his later solo stuff was crap. He wasn't the kind of guy that I'd ever have chosen to meet up with in real life for a pint and a packet of scampy fries. Oh my god, I haven't had scampy fries in a very long time. Because John Lennon was also a massive bell end. He, he only revealed the origin of that. <laughs> Let's just throw in an allegedly there. <laughs> he only reveals the or origin of that menacing lyric from Getting Better during an interview with Playboy magazine, which was conducted just a couple of weeks before he was shot and killed by mad fan Mark Chapman in New York in 1980. He admitted, It is a diary form of writing. I used to be cruel to my woman, any woman. I was a hitter. I couldn't express myself, and I hit. I fought men, and I hit women. Dude. What are you up to? Shut the f up. More importantly, don't fing beat women, you dick. John's first wife, Cynthia Lennon, bore the brunt of his violence and cruel behavior, although it's alleged that the rage inside Lennon also boiled over during his later and more famous relationship with <sighs> Yoko Ono. Yeah, 
power again. It's only towards the very end of his relationship with Cynthia, when his son Julian would have been about five years old, that Lennon got into a drunken stupor and admitted that he'd been unfaithful while out on tour. Not with, not just with Yoko, but with literally thousands of women. Holy shit, John! Quite remarkably, when Lennon decided to leave Cynthia for a pregnant Yoko just a few weeks later, he had the audacity to file for divorce on the grounds that it was Cynthia who had been unfaithful, a claim which Cynthia vehemently denied. He later re reached a divorce settlement on Cynthia's own more truthful petition. <laughs> yes, like, who was the one who was unfaithful? Was it the rock star? The, li the literally John Lennon from the f***ing Beatles with screaming women following him around? Or was it his wife back home who was the one having the affairs? I fucking wonder, John. I wonder. Bell, allegedly. It's just a bell. That's the meme. That's the whole meme. It wasn't just the women in John's life that were victims of his violence. He openly admitted that he came very close to killing a man in the Cavern Club in Liverpool in 1963, just as the Beatles were beginning to take off. I just... This is so far removed from acceptable behavior. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I almost killed a man. Fuck, man. I mean, that's intense. Anyone who's almost killed someone, like not in war or whatever, just like in drunken fights or stuff, it's like, holy shit. That's really intense. The man in question was the DJ Bob Willer, who probably got off lightly with cracked ribs when John attacked him and continued to pummel away even as Bob was lying, bleeding on the floor. The reason Bob had dared to make a bunch, make a subtle implication that Lennon was in a gay relationship with the band's manager, Brian Epstein, Lennon later recalled, so I was beating the sh** out of him and hitting him with a big stick and it was the first time I thought, I can kill this guy. I just saw it, like on a screen, that if I hit him once more, that was gonna be it. Oh my god, John Lennon, you psycho. <laughs> Why you like this? Lennon certainly had an unusual upbringing. What a surprise. The guy who's super f***ed up and beats people almost to death and his wife had a... Had an unusual upbringing. His largely absent dad. Shocking. Walked out on the family when John was just five years old. And they'd only meet again 20 years later when his dad reached out to the superstar stunned during the height of Beatlemania. Oh my god. Although, like, if I was John Lennon and in this situation, It'd be the greatest satisfaction to be like, fuck off, Dad. <laughs> it's like, John, you're super rich now. Yeah, can we be father and son again? Fuck off, you dick. John essentially told him to do one, and they never spoke again. And I bet that felt fucking great. And in a very disturbing audio confession from 1979, John revealed how he once regretted not making sexual advances on his own mother when he was a kid. Uh, <laughs> what? He said, I always think I should have done it. Presumably, she would have allowed it. John, this is why you're f***ed up. That is very, that is some really f***ed up thinking, mate. But contrary to how Lennon often painted himself as a working class hero, brought up in the slums of Northern England on bread and jam, his home life was fairly comfortable. Paul McCartney recalls, recalls how, how amazed he felt when he visited John's family home for the first time, as he hasn't seen anything so posh in his life. And there was so much mistruth and hypocrisy scattered across John's contradictory life. He declared himself to be an anti-capitalist, but he was constantly chasing the dollar from day one and had a burning desire to be rich and famous. Yeah. I mean, this is extremely common, though, isn't it? You see this all the time. <laughs> like, no, 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 I hate money. And it's like, yeah, but I'll do anything for money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you like money, just admit it. It's okay. I don't know. I like money. What's the big issue? In his signature tune, Imagine, he asked the audience to imagine a world with no possessions, no heaven, no religion. It's apparently easy if you try. Although, it's probably a bit harder to imagine a life without possessions when you're living the life of a pampered millionaire in a fancy hotel. And over the years, John had become obsessed with enough New Age religions to last him an eternity. He was often seen as an angry political activist in his later years, but in fact, he could barely be bothered to support his own weight. His most notable act of political activism was the laziest imaginable, a bed in. Oh yeah, where he just stayed in bed. It's like, that's not protesting, John. That's just being lazy. If there was Netflix, people would be like, it's just like a weekend, isn't it, John? What the f*** are you talking about? He and Yoko spent two weeks just lounging around, lounging around in beds in two of the most expensive hotels in the world, offering vague and meaningless encouragement to give peace a chance while being attended to around the clock by hotel staff and their own maid. Sadly, this didn't seem to prevent the outbreak of future wars. It didn't? Oh. I thought it totally worked. Weird. <laughs> 
<laughs> and here's another thing. Paul McCartney often gets blamed for breaking up the Beatles, as he was the first member of the band to announce to the press that he was quitting. But in fact, it was all Lennon's doing. He had already declared to the rest of the band that he had lost interest towards the very end. He had become addicted to heroin. Wow, I didn't know that. And he was difficult to motivate into the, in the studio, much to the frustration of the other members. <laughs> They'd be like, John! Can you stop doing heroin and start writing some fucking songs? We've spent all of that Beatles money. No. No, I don't think I will. They didn't. They're all super rich. Uh, he's, his insistence on having Yoko Ono in the recording studio at all times, sticking her oar into everything as if she was the fifth member of the Beatles, was clearly vexing the band, but they were unwilling to challenge her presence in case it provoked another of John's explosive rages. Oh my god, that must have been painful she's just in the corner screaming that john's like imagine all ah! <laughs> <are> you guy? <laughs> lennon later admitted that the disbanding of the beatles was his decision but rather bitterly expressed regret that mccartney got the blame if only because it meant that mccartney got the extra publicity for his first solo album oh my god John Lennon, I don't like you. However, perhaps the biggest victim in this woeful story of a dickhead is that Lennon's is Lennon's first son, Julian. The birth of Julian in 1963 was unplanned and led to a rushed wedding after Cynthia revealed the pregnancy to John. He responded with a proposal dripping in Beatlesque romance. There's only one thing for it. We'll have to get married. It's understandable in many ways that one of the most famous and in-demand men on the planet would end up following in the footsteps of his own father by becoming a largely absent parent. Julian was born while John was out on tour. When the Beatles eventually rocked up to meet his new son, it was only a fleeting visit as John made plans to go on a four-day holiday to Barcelona with Brian Epstein. Also, I mean, it's like, yeah, okay, so if you've got an absentee dad, um, I feel, doesn't the statistics, I'm not sure what the statistics are, but I feel like I've heard that it bears out more that you're likely to be an absentee dad yourself, rather than being like, man, neither my dad in the picture sucked, let's be a good dad. Um, I feel like it's more correlation rather than the opposite happening, right? I'm not sure though, so don't take that as rote. But even when John was around, the atmosphere was tense. The former housekeeper of the Lennons later revealed that John would constantly fly into a rage at the very young and sensitive Julian, and striking for having bad table manners, despite the housekeeper's claim that Julian's table manners were actually pretty good for a toddler. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, although to be honest, I beat my child all the time where they can't eat properly. They're nearly two. Fuck <laughs> John, no. That was a joke. Don't do that. When Julian dared to giggle, John would shout at him, I hate the way you fucking laugh. And the boy was reduced to tears. Oh my God, I don't understand. I don't understand how people are dicks to their children. It's just beyond my comprehension. It's like, yeah, my kid annoys the shit out of me sometimes. The other night, it's like, she just decides to get up at three in the morning and doesn't go back to sleep until five. Just like, that's it. And I'm like, oh my God, why? But I'm still like, I love you so much. <laughs> And that's it. It's like the idea that there'd be some punishment for this is just like crazy. And that's not I'm saying I'm against punishing my children. Of course you should punish your children. It's not Montessori. But it's like, what the fuck, John Lennon, you prick? Julian was only five years old when his parents divorced in 1968. And after his dad moved to New York with Yoko Ono, oh. Oh, all contact was lost for a few years, echoing John's own upbringing. Even though there were several attempts to reconnect in the 1970s, with young Julian always having to make the transatlantic hop, the visits were brief, irregular, and awkward. And he must have felt particularly hurt for when Yoko Ono gave birth to Sean Lennon in 1975, and John suddenly decided to become a doting and dedicated father for the first time, writing sloppy songs. Uh, sloppy? Probably soppy, I guess, soppy? Sloppy is like messy. Soppy is like you know, oh, about Sean and even taking a five-year break from his career to raise him. When, fuck, man. Fuck. God damn, what a dickhead. When asked about his differing attitude to his two sons, John replied, Sean is a plan child, and therein lies the difference. I fucking hate you. I think you're such a bellend. Just a bell on its own. Nothing else, that's it, it's just a bell. John's lack of interest in Julian even extended beyond the grave. Julian wasn't mentioned anywhere in John's will, which meant that the bulk of his $220 million fortune ended up in the hands of Yoko and Sean. God damn. 
This was a particularly bitter pill to swallow for Julian, as he already lost half of his own comparatively modest trust to Sean in 1975. John and his first wife, Cynthia's divorce settlement, included the setting, of a, setting up of a £100,000 trust for Julian, became with the condition that the money would be divided between any future offspring from John. So Sean grabbed half of that small trust on the day he was born, and now stands in line to inherit nearly all of his dad's vast wealth, leaving Julian with nothing. Julian did eventually manage to secure an undisclosed settlement from the estate in 1996, but it sounds as if it was just crumbs. Julian later revealed that the settlement wasn't fair, but he didn't wish the legal battle to drag on any longer, particularly as he recognized that there was far more money on the estate side than his own. I mean, yeah, I... John, it might be a dick move, but he can leave his money to whoever he wants. He used some of that money to buy back some of his dad's mementos, as no personal belongings of any kind had been offered from Yoko, who clearly felt that Sean was John's one and only son. Why would you want the f***ing mementos, mate? Just get on with it. Just be like, f*** you, dad. Yeah. Well, fuck you, Dad. Quite incredibly, Julian even had to fork out huge sums of money at an auction to buy a series of letters and postcards exchanged between him and his dad. Oh my god. He got some financial help with this from none other than Paul McCartney, who clearly felt that the situation was ridiculous. Legend! Julian had always described Paul McCartney as behaving more like a father to him than John ever did. Paul McCartney, you f legend. It's easy to forget how public adoration for John Lennon had reduced to a light simmer during most of the 1970s, and his solo stuff was generally regarded as disappointing twaddle about his and Yoko's relationship. Yes. Following that five-year hiatus to bring up Sean, his 1980 comeback album Double Fantasy was released just a couple of weeks before his death and was initially met with an underwhelming response and relatively poor sales. It only topped the charts on both sides of the Atlantic following his murder, at which point John suddenly evolved into a celebrated legend and certified genius once again. Again. Hopefully, this video has done a little bit to rectify that f***ing lie. But we should also remember that the genius who was preaching messages of love and peace in his lyrics was also a violent, abusive, manipulative, neglectful, and hypocritical dickhead. If only someone had advised him at an early age to give peace a chance, things would have turned out very differently. We can only imagine. This has been an episode of Brain Blaze. Thank you so much for watching, you legend. If you'd like to uh, get your hands on some of the merch, you can go to perchthemerch.co. Yeah, you can. There's a link below. And thank you for watching.